Hi everyone, Steve here from Voices from the Mausoleum, and with me today to talk about his feature debut, Tyler Chipman. Thank you so Hi. much for joining me, bud. It is uh, my pleasure to be here. Absolutely, Steve. Thank you for having me on. Of course, of course. Well, um, you just celebrated your world premiere of The Shade uh, at Brooklyn Horror Fest. How was it? It was incredible. It was a fantastic experience. It was, um, yeah, it was at times um, terrifying uh, in some respects, but uh, yeah, we had a great time. Um, the people at Brooklyn Horror Fest do an incredible job putting together a top tier festival, and uh, yeah, it was an honor. It was an honor uh, to be there. Yeah, it uh, it was my second year going. I started last year, and I was just like, it's the it, you know what they do a great job of making it like an event, right? It just feels like a yeah, they totally do. And it's a, it's a there's a bunch of people who like really care about what they have to offer and the people who are offering uh, all the things care equally. And uh, yeah, it's it's there's uh, nothing but um, good vibes there. I think. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. Fantastic. And so yeah. so at Brooklyn Horror, there was the premiere of The Shade. So just sort of for everyone watching, if you can give us a little non spoiler introduction into what The Shade is all about. <laughs> yeah. I'll try. I can be spoilery at times, but um, you know, the shade. Um, uh, I met a very good friend of mine named Dave, David Purdy, back in um, 2015, and we sort of, um, you know, as we became friends, sort of concocted this crazy plan that we would um, that we would sort of join forces and, and create this production company um, and tell stories um, uh, via the feature film. Um, medium and i think um over the first few years we we kind of had a lot of different ideas and you know we had a lot of different um sort of concepts for scripts that you know are alive and well today but we landed on um sort of this particular uh concept because we had gotten to talking about a very good friend that i had had um, um who lost his father in a, in, a, in a sort of very tragic way. And it sort of, you know, sent us down this, this sort of avenue where we were talking about, have we seen a movie, you know, that deals in, in, in some of these things uh, that was sort of presented honestly and not necessarily as sort of like, um, uh, I don't want to call it cheap, but, but as something that sort of sets a story in motion that's never explored more thoroughly. And um, yeah. so with that, it, incredibly long preamble i will say that the shade is about um it follows a 20 year old community college student named ryan um through a fall um an october through sort of mid-december where he is sort of at home uh, he is the middle brother of three he's sort of been tasked with taking care of his younger brother james while his mom who's a single mom because he has recently uh, about a year prior lost his father uh he's trying to you know do the community college thing. He's trying to, um, you know, hold down a job, take care of his younger brother. He's sort of doing like the father figure thing for his younger brother, and his older brother, who's a senior in college. He's a he's a collegiate athlete. Comes home uh, mid semester, sort of under some very mysterious um, circumstances, uh, and it seems as though when he gets home, he might not have come back uh, alone. Right. Right. For lack of a better phrase yeah he's latched on <laughs> yes correct correct so i mean what i thought was really impressive um about the film was just the way in which you put you know mental health front and center here in a way that was pretty earnest and pretty sort of um uh impactful like i knew like i immediately came up to you and i was like uh, i'm a horror fan and the therapist yes thank you for a movie like this <laughs> yes and i appreciate that wholeheartedly i was ecstatic that, that you came up and said that because oh yeah, my god you know, yeah a um, horror fan and a therapist that's like a you know that's a big deal, that's a big deal Steve. <laughs> it was like just perfect that i was sitting there that's um, great. but yeah so what was it like for you to sort of incorporate these mental health themes um you know i definitely kind of especially the kind of the symptomatology and, and sort of how you worked what he was going through well really what all the brothers were going through mm -hmm. um but predominantly pre uh, predominantly through the lens of the main character kind of and how did you sort of plot that out and what was sort of your um yeah i guess your goal with him yeah 
Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it, it could be a lengthy answer. Um, no, so obviously, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the main character, um, and yeah, just feel free to jump in and be like, well, go further in that direction or anything else. But um, so <laughs> very obviously, uh, you know, the first time we meet him, he's, he's sort of having this very um, severe nocturnal panic attack. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a movie that sort of puts under the microscope uh, several sort of mental health afflictions. I think generalized anxiety disorder, um, you know, panic disorder, major depressive disorder, you know, suicidality, which is an umbrella term that involves many things. Mm -hmm. um, so and it's sort of an evolution for the main character, you know. Um, I think that in terms of what what the work that I had to do to sort and you mentioned symptomatology um, in terms of you know, the anxiety disorder and the panic disorder stuff. Uh, it required very little research. Uh, <laughs> these are things, you know, that I, I you know, and I don't want to make this about me, but, you know, um, when I was in my early 20s, you know, I had my first panic attack. Yeah. It's something that I've been dealing with for, you know, almost a couple of decades now, and that I'll probably be dealing with in, on, on some level uh, forever. So, I, I you know, I've, I've done all my homework, you know, I've seen all the all the doctors and talk to the therapists and, you know, been prescribed all the medications and, and these things. Mm -hmm. Well, you just said something that was, I think, very, um, it's a very common misconception around mental health. It's like, you don't just get better, right? It's sort of exactly. like, Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, you said like, you said, it's like something that you're probably going to be dealing with for a long time, right? Because that's just, it's sort of like an ebbs and flows sort of element. There's no question. There's no question about it. And, you know, they're, they're in, in, in to be quite frank, I've, uh, you know, there have been years of my life maybe where I was like, maybe this is gone. You know, maybe I'm, you know, I've been feeling great for a very long time, you know, um, and then nope. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? It all it takes is, is, you know, uh, well, you know, it could be just about anything, frankly, that, that triggers sort of, um, a period of time, even one attack or a period of time in your life where you're going to be dealing with things, uh, whether it be any of those those sort of ailments I mentioned earlier, but uh, yeah, I mean, I was very familiar with um, with all the symptoms, and there are an infinite number of symptoms that go along with with anxiety and, and panic, and that's one of the that's one of the the things that I learned that sort of helped me deal with it is that it can rear its head in all these different ways because I yeah. when you know when I started having panic attacks, my symptoms were you know A, B, and C. And then when I sort of were like, okay, when I feel A, B, and C, this is probably just a panic attack. You know, I'm not having a heart attack. I don't need to call an ambulance, whatever else. But, uh, you know, you get used to that stuff. Maybe, you know, they start to abate, the attacks start to abate. And then all of a sudden symptoms DEF, which you've never experienced before, crop up. And you're like, well, this is something totally different. Yeah. Why? And, but it's just the same thing presenting itself in a different way, which is a, yeah, it's a, it's my least favorite thing I think about uh, about anxiety and panic disorder is it can really take all kinds of different uh, different forms. How was it for you putting um, a bit of your own experience into your work? I guess as all I guess a lot of artists do do that, um, but there sure. is sort of um, well, I'll let you know I'll let you sort of go into it. what was that like? No, you know, um, I guess it made me more confident that I could tell the story honestly. Um, you know, at least in that regard, I felt like, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen a movie that, you know, that I, I've, we've all seen characters in movies have panic attacks, but, you know, um, they're sort of like one off things where maybe it's not something that the character is dealing with throughout the course of the narrative. Um, right. So I felt, you know, I guess I just felt like I, I get this, you know, I uh, and I can, I think, maybe better than some other people, not all, you know, could tell a story about that sort of thing um hopefully a little more honestly in in, in a more straightforward manner mm -hmm. than what i had had personally seen um so it yeah it, it it just felt like yeah i mean this maybe the story needs to be told um but you know obviously that's not the entirety of the narrative ryan does go through a lot of other things that you know i don't and, and i'm thankful that i don't have firsthand experience with which required obviously, you know, um, interviewing, you know, a lot of um, discussions with 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 people who have been through some of the same sorts of things that Ryan and his family members have been through. Um, a lot yeah, of research. I read a lot of books. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, you cut, you cut off a little bit. 
Oh, sorry. My no, bad. no, you're good. I was just curious what kind okay, of okay. Like, research went into it. You know, in terms of, um, you know, one of the things I did not want to do was be inauthentic or in a way that would do a disservice to people who genuinely deal with things like, you know, um, suicidal bereavement, uh, major depressive disorder, suicidality. Um, you know, I've, I know some people personally that have been through a lot of those things, you know, uh, it was very gracious of them to lend me their time, um, and be very sort of honest and open with me about the things they experienced, the things they saw. Um, I read some fantastic books. Um, I suppose a few that come to mind, you know, I read, um, a book called the noonday demon by Andrew Solomon, um, which is all about, you know, his experiences with depression. Um, K. Redfield Jameson wrote a book called Night Falls Fast um, about suicidality and suicide. Um, Jesse Baring wrote an incredible book called Suicidal, Why We Kill Ourselves. Um, and yeah, it's just, I think one of the things that struck me is how little I knew about some of this stuff, even though it's a, sort of like, you know, um, very unfortunately, sort of an epidemic of our time, yeah, and maybe past times as well. But yeah, you know, it's incredible. It's 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 such a nuanced sort of topic that I think sometimes when people think about, they want to sort of, you know, think about it in black and white terms. But it's it's anything but that. So um, yeah, it was it was an incredible learning experience, and uh, I guess I just wanted to make sure that you know I was I was um, you know. I could tell the story in a way that would not do, you know, anyone that actually was experiencing experiencing these things a disservice because that doesn't seem fair. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Something that I, I really appreciated in the film um, was a mental health story through uh, a male perspective, um, in the sense of a lot of men often don't feel like they can express their feelings in an authentic way. Um, it's a lot of like, just brush stuff under the rug, kind of put on this like persona of like masculinity. And so yeah. the fact that you have sort of three brothers dealing with loss in their way, um, struggling with mental health, I think is pretty important. I mean, was that something that was sort of um, obvious to you as you were making it or? It was essential um, yeah. to the to the telling of the story. You know, I mean, it's no um, uh, it's certainly no coincidence that you know the uh, that the film is set in sort of a, a, a small town uh, New England uh, place, and you know these are the three sons of a of a contractor. You know, from a blue collar family. Um, you know, there's sort of. Uh, I don't want to call it an archetype because I hope that my, you know, the characters that I write are a little bit more well-rounded than that. But um, yeah, I mean, these, yeah, these guys grew up in a way that probably, you know, uh, gave them some very specific ideas about what masculinity is, how they should conduct themselves. Um, you know, uh, I, I hate to be vague, but I also don't want to like pigeonhole. Uh, the characters or, or over explain them. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they are unable for whatever reason to really be, you know, vocal about what they were experiencing. Um, you know, they certainly aren't the type of people who would, you know, uh, want to go out and ask for help and, and seek help where they could find it. And, yeah, I mean that was absolutely part of the story. You know what I mean? There's a, there's sort of a misguided masculine ideal at the core of of uh, of what you know at the core of their belief system, I guess you could say. That when you kind of cross it with with mental illness and some of these these the types of suffering that they're experiencing, that it's a it's a very sort of volatile um, combination. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And something also sort of that kind of really spoke to me as well, just just kind of as a gay man myself, like through the character of Nicholas, um, you know, I don't want to give too much away throughout the, the, the story, but it's certainly like, because I think it also kind of sort of came up during the Q&A at, at Brooklyn Horror 
about him just kind of like wanting his friend and sort of being there for Ryan, but also sort of brushing off some of the symptoms and what he's going through. And, sure. you know, uh, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are sort of with with this trope or this experience, but for a lot of gay men, it's like, you know, we often, I think, use humor to sort of like mask a lot of the hard feelings. And I, and I feel like that character of Nicholas certainly resonated with me in that regard. Sure. You know, and then, yeah. and then, so yeah, just something I just kind of wanted to point out that about absolutely. Really, you know, no, I, I, and I love. I think the Nicholas character is. I, I'm particularly proud of of the Nicholas character. You know, and um, I think one of the things I really like about it is as people see see the film, um, they'll kind of come to me and say like, "This is sort of how I felt about Nicholas. I saw this in Nicholas," and it's not always what I had in mind, uh, but that mm -hmm. I think just makes, that's amazing to me. You know what I mean? I love that. I mean, um, I guess, I think one of my aims with the Nicholas character was that, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I've, I've sort of been seeing, you know, in a lot of film and television that there has been sort of this like gay best friend trope um, that I think is sort of like a little bit tired. And I, one of my very good friends, uh, is gay. One of my best friends, his name is Nicholas and he'll be absolutely thrilled that I mentioned him, uh, here. And, and he is, uh, he is, you know, I did name the character after my friend, Nick. And, uh, I just wanted to be like, look, you know, and this, you know, Nicholas is far more of like an alpha male type than, than Ryan is, you know what I mean? And, 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 but not only that, he's also, you know, um, a little bit more apt to to speak his mind, to not necessarily like turn away from things that are bothering him. You know what I mean? And it's just it's like he has a lot of the qualities that I think if Ryan had, um, he would be probably a lot better off. So I think that that I kind of wanted to to play uh, to juxtapose, I guess, those two characters in that way that hopefully seems a little bit uh, fresh and and less tropey than. Than maybe what some people have been have been seeing in the uh, oh there's plenty <laughs> there's plenty yeah. of character tropes out there i don't like sure, well, sure, sure. you fell into any trap <laughs> right right <laughs> i'm not trying to turn this into a coca-cola commercial either but you know <laughs> my mouth gets dry i'm sorry no you're good <laughs> um listen we're not sponsored by like sprite or anything so. no no <laughs> not at all like our competitor you know <laughs> yeah and i'm not uh, sponsored by coca-cola just for the record but yeah yeah <laughs> But um, something that I, I also really appreciated were like the therapy scenes felt pretty yeah. like to a T like, you know, again, don't worry. I wasn't sitting there like I would have done this different or I would have done. Yeah. This. Well, I hope I hope not. It was pretty I um, mean, pretty classic CBT skills that were being um, for anyone watching. That's cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, yeah. And there's other components, I'm sure, um, that you were putting in there. Um, shout out to Michael. Right. Play the Michael therapist. Bowman. Yes, incredible. My, when I yeah. I told my husband he was in the film, he was like, my husband's a big fan of The Good Wife and uh, yes, yeah. The Good Fight. That's him. That's Michael. <laughs> That's yeah. Michael. Uh, so uh, my husband was like, oh, cool. Um, yeah. So I guess what? Yeah. So what were like the maybe some challenges or some goals you had in mind in sort of nailing the therapy scenes throughout the film? Sure. Well, um, you know, I'm fortunate to have had the benefit of, of therapy, different kinds of therapy um, throughout my life. So I was sort of uh, familiar, you know, with the, with the, the therapist patient dynamic. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to do and one of the first things I talked to Michael about was that, you know, I wanna sort of stray away from this sort of like stuffy V-neck sweater wearing like therapist person who's like asking introspective questions with, you know, deadpan. I'm like, I hate, you know, I, <laughs> it's all you say. I see it over and over again. I'm like, I was like, is, are, is this what therapists are like? I don't think so. No, I've I, never I, had I, I've, I my sessions like this sometimes. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and how don't that, care. <laughs> well, not only will they not care, but I think it's much, it puts them at ease far more than someone who's, you know, it's almost like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, off-putting in a way some of these sort of therapist tropes you see in, in sure. film and television but um i think the important thing in their dynamic was that you know i wanted it to be a cognitive behavioral therapist because i didn't want you know this like i didn't want to say something that i wasn't intending to say and i think that 
you know, if, if he had been like a doctor of psychiatric medicine and he was like, well, I'm writing you this prescription, we're going to up this. And I, I, I don't know if you noticed, but he's always saying like, well, we can talk to your doc if, you know, if this is an anxiety related issue and maybe your Ativan dose needs to be upped a little bit, maybe we could go from one gram to two yeah. grams or whatever else, you know what I mean? And, no, I and think that's like awesome. that. I that I clocked that right away because I, so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. So within my scope of practice, I can't prescribe medication, but I sure. certainly will talk with my clients about it. And sort of like that is kind of secondary to what yeah, we're yeah. doing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful because I think what I didn't want was for anybody to, to be able to sort of paint, uh, you know, ulterior motives onto the Dr. Houston character and say, well, you know, he's got to prescribe this or that. Like I, and I wasn't trying to condemn you know, uh, you know, the state of, of psychiatric medicine or, or therapy or anything like that. I think I wanted to say like, Hey, Dr. Houston and Ryan have like a, a real relationship. Like they've been at this for a while, you know, before Ryan lost his father, he was having panic attacks and mm -hmm. he's been seeing this guy, uh, for a while, you know, for, for probably two years or more. So they don't, you know, he knows the breathing exercises. You know what I'm saying? He knows the five steps to like identifying his trigger and like, you know, affirming in the mirror that he's going to be all, whatever, however, you know, there's a million different ways that you you're taught to like diffuse panic attacks and different things like that. They're, and, you know, um, so I wanted to be like, they're, they're past that. So, so at this point, you know, they are doing maybe more sort of a talk therapy thing just because they have a relationship. Yeah. You know, Dr. Houston cares about about Ryan and they have made strides in certain ways, um, even if it's not, you know, uh, linear progress. Nothing ever is, especially, you know, progress with regards to to alleviating mental mental health or symptoms. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just it was important to me that those uh, that those scenes be authentic Um and yeah, I mean, like I said, I wasn't kidding earlier when I said the fact that you came up to me after the screening and said like, hey, I'm a therapist. And that was, you know, you got it. I was like, oh, thank, thank God. You know, no, it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. So thank I'm you. happy to hear that. I really yeah. am. Um, yeah. You know, because certainly like a lot, I mean, a lot of films, not a lot, but like, you know, there are horror films now that are talking about mental health, but it's sometimes it's sort of done in a way that isn't super engaging or isn't quite authentic uh it's sort yeah. of the process um and what i like with with ryan is yeah he's clearly like you were saying he's clearly in like the maintenance stage of his treatment it's sort of mm -hmm. like and then this kind of recent development with his family and what's going on with his brother and is sort of challenging that and it's kind of like how you were saying at the beginning it's like you know you've experienced abc well, now here's DEF, and this is sort of like exactly. a whole other slew of things. And it, 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 that yes, and it can be so disheartening um, because it can feel like falling back to square one, or maybe even farther back. Because you know, um, when you start experiencing stuff and it's so hard, and you're like, "What do I do? Who do I ask for help? Like, is a, am I ever going to feel better?" You know, and then you start. You know, it takes a lot of hard work, and it takes dedication, and and being open and honest and and vulnerable. Um, with people to sort of see to see progress so when you take those steps backwards oh man you can almost end up um and i know from experience uh you can end up in a in a worse place a lower place than when you started and it's just like twice as hard to get out man it's a mm -hmm. it's a, it can be tough you know um, absolutely and and, yeah. and very isolating too i think another element no question. That I wanted to ask you about are the relationships in this movie. Um, you know, Ryan has a supportive mother, has a supportive yeah. girlfriend, has a, yeah. you know, has a best friend. Um, a lot of people reaching out to him, but mm -hmm. he just can't quite grasp it. Right. Um, can you tell us maybe talk a little bit more about the relationships in the movie? There is. Yeah. I mean, that was something um, that we we thought long and hard about Dave and I, who, who, you know, kind of helped me come up with the bones of the story and everything before I went up and wrote the screenplay. But, um, I think so if, if, you know, we don't have to go through the movie scene by scene or anything, cause I, sure. I <laughs> no one has seen it yet, but I think one of the first instances in, in the story where you see Ryan sort of have a, it almost, you know, a reaction 
to somebody who's trying to offer him help that sort of might take you aback is, is after he has, you know, he's, he's, he's at this Halloween party, has this very sort of severe panic attack in the bathroom. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Alex, uh, his girlfriend decides to go home with him. And, uh, you know, she's saying, Hey, look, you know, like, you, you know, you need to take your Ativan with you. If you're going to leave the house, like we could have diffused this, like it, you, maybe, you know, it could, it wouldn't have gone as far. And I think, you know, he has this very, like, uh, I don't want to, he has sort of a severe reaction. And I, you know, in my mind, um, it's shame based, you know, I think that sometimes when you have, you know, this sort of thing happens to you, it's, you feel a little bit embarrassed, you know, you can feel sort of ashamed of yourself because maybe, you know, you're putting, you know, a burden on someone else or maybe impeding someone else's ability to, to enjoy their night or, or whatever else. Yeah. And I think, um, Yes, I think struggling with any and all kinds of mental illness can be extraordinarily isolating because there's this sort of, you know, double-edged blade where on one hand, you know, um, when people are trying to help you, you're like, how could you help me? You don't get this. You don't have this. You know, you don't understand. Uh, and on the other hand, if people are not necessarily talking about it or asking you if you're all right. You're like, don't you give a shit? You know? So it's like, that was, that's sort of, you know, what, what, what he's going through in the second half of the movie is he's condemning people that he doesn't think are trying to help him mm -hmm. and shoving away people that are trying to help him. And it's just this like terrible sort of cyclical thing where, um, yeah, you just end up sort of self-isolating in a way that that's only going to make things uh, worse. So, yeah. yeah. It's all yeah. those sort of like going to some CBT sort of terminology. It's all those cognitive distortions that sort of just Correct. Like in the way, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think the cog you mentioned cognitive distortions, and I think that is one of the the most interesting parts of reading about you know some of the things uh, that are looked at in the film, and especially suicidality. Is you know when people who don't experience uh, who are lucky enough to not have to deal with things like suicidality try and understand or imagine what those things would be like you know um they're imagining them in a way that you know that says like well if if you know they're they're attributing the ability for logical patterns of thought to someone who probably doesn't have that ability like they should because yeah. of what they're suffering from these cognitive distortions as you're saying and that's i think that was one of the most eye-opening things that that sort of i i I learned or uncovered in my research um, about this stuff. And it's, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's scary. Yeah. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you sure. know, I definitely would love to learn a little bit about maybe the writing process. I mean, we certainly have people who maybe want to do their own feature one day um, yeah. watching and, and sort of, um, you know, I guess a little peek behind the curtain, right? Sort of speak like, so what is sort of like your <laughs> writing process? How long did it take? You know, yeah. how do you, organize it all yes so I, I a little bit of a disclaimer i will say that i i'll talk about my writing process and my you know my creative process that i totally came up with on the fly um as as will anybody who wants to to mm -hmm. write a script or direct a movie or anything else um and there are infinite ways um to get from point a to b from from idea to to finish script so um you know feel free to disregard everything that I say or, or, <laughs> or, or think it's brilliant, uh, whatever you want. Um, so I, um, my mind for whatever reason craves, uh, order and organization. So, um, I realized very early on that sort of, um, if I was going to sit down and write a story, um, I would have to, I would, there was no way I was going to sit down and be like, all right, let's go. You know, and I've heard of, yeah of writers doing this, I, I absolutely cannot do it. Um, in terms of the shade, um, you know, I had a couple ideas for sort of pivotal scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of knew what was going to happen. I, well, I definitely knew it was going to happen at the midpoint. I had a very good idea how the movie was going to end. And I had a very good picture of who the main character, who Ryan was going to be. So I think, you know, Dave, Dave Purdy, who I mentioned before, he's my producer and, and sort of helped me with the with the story structure and everything. We would talk a lot about, um, you know, uh, 
potential for for scenes uh, for for things that the character could experience. Um, we read a lot of books, uh, you know, uh, about existential philosophy and suicidality and things, kind of like generate ideas. And I think, you know, for me, you know, ideas come all the time. You know, I, you know, you're walking home from work, listening to music, and you're daydreaming, right? You're, you know, yeah. you're you're in the shower, you know, before bed, and you're daydreaming, and you're you're thinking of of, of ideas uh, for scenes, um, some which will just sort of come out of the ether. So I knew three act structure and I said, okay, if I, if I can have, if I can get like an inciting incident, a first act climax, the midpoint I had, I think I know what happens at the second act climax and then how sort of the, the movie is going to end like this major decision that the character will make. So, you know, I really was like, if I just have like the biggest scenes in the movie, like laid out all the stuff in the middle, I can kind of fill in. So I, I, quite literally had a chart and I would, you know, it was like, it was a piece of paper and I divided it in half and then I divided each half in half for the ax. Um, and I just wrote the, a little short description of the scene on all the major plot points. And I brought it to Dave. I said, okay, I got the bones of the story in so far as the major plot points. I said, so what happens in between all this stuff? <laughs> fill in the gaps. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, you know, um, that was just sort of a lot of, you know, you'd be amazed, um, at what you can come up with if you just start talking or just start typing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and by, by no means was I writing a script, by no means was I writing dialogue, uh, or, you know, uh, detailed like stage direction or anything. I would, you know, I was just writing like, you know, uh, you know. This could happen. Jason shows up at school. It's pouring rain. Ryan comes down. He says, I have to talk, whatever. And there's tons of stuff that I came up with that is never made it to the script, much less the movie. But, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, after you have sort of all your major plot events, like, in, in, you know, the ones I mentioned earlier, you can kind of just sort of dream freely about all the in-betweens. And when you look at it as a whole, you'll say like, okay, well, this doesn't really make sense. Or, oh, well, I see this happening with this character and like, we have to wrap this up. So let's toss that out and, and you know, finish this Alex subplot here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it's, I'll tell you what, it's, it's just a lot of, of sort of, you know, trial and error, you know, writing stuff, looking at it the next day and being like, oh, that works. Or like, why, why would I have written that? Um, you know, uh, yeah. until you, until you have something, that feels like the story. It feels true to the characters. Um, it has a, 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 a sort of a pace and a logic that feels good. Um, and I, you know, I tend to be um, very hard on myself. Maybe that's not the right phrase. I, I'm very, you know, if if there's anything that feels off, I'll like, I'll just, you know, um, I'll sort of torture myself trying to figure out why until like. You know the problem is alleviated or whatever, but it's I think that, that's like, hyper focused to the point of um, you know hypercritical. Maybe maybe a little bit. I don't. Know. You no question, but I, you know, and I, and I think you have to be, uh, especially you know if you're going to commit this stuff to to film or to video, rather uh, as most people do. I mean, you know, you've got to you've got to put some time into it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, and yeah. That, that, that's certainly no guarantee that you're going to come out with something. You know terrific on uh on the other on the other side and i know because i've gone through the process plenty of times with commercials and shorts and come out with something that wasn't terrific on the other side so um but you you know you know it just takes uh it takes effort you it's know in practice and, and, yeah. and, and sort of getting past those initial sort of blocks that we put up for ourselves yeah right? absolutely and i think the more that you open yourself up to uh, to the fact that you're going to write stuff and come up with stuff that just is, doesn't work. You know, it just doesn't work. Uh, that stuff's great. Keep it coming because you know what I mean? You're eventually going to get to something that does work. Yeah. Uh, it's that stuff's a rite of passage. I mean, there's no, it, whoever, whoever your favorite screenwriter is, I can tell you that they've written a whole bunch of like terrible shit uh, before. And even in the, your favorite movie, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they did the work. They 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 tossed aside the unnecessary, the stuff that didn't work, and and they they kind of kept kept searching until um, until they sure. had 
what did. That's just the stuff we don't see. So everyone just assumes it comes out perfect the first try, but that's not the case. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or at least workable. I don't know about perfect. <laughs> Even <laughs> something that's approaching like adequate, we'll say. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Fair, fair. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was going to ask for you know if, if there's any advice that you can give, but you sort of just uh, segued perfectly into it. Yeah, you know, it, it, advice in terms of in screenwriting or or just screenwriting, you know, whatever you know, the creative process in general. I think you know, uh, be ready for rejection. I think that's one thing that was very hard for me to learn. I'm a very sensitive person. I want people to admire and enjoy the things that that I write, that I make, um, and I think it's you know. Uh, this is a business where no one benefits from sugarcoating. Um, so that's something you, you know, people are going to have to deal with. I'm, you know, you'll deal with it at every phase of, of, you know, development, pre-production, you know, the shoot post, you know, trying to sell the movie. I mean, you know, um, I'm talking obviously specifically about making an independent film, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough out there, you know, so you have to, there, there's sort of this line where you have to know. You have to stick to your guns, you know, you have to know you, or you have to have belief in what you're doing uh, in the story you're trying to tell, but also, you know, not be so closed off to what, you know, other people's ideas or, or the feedback you're getting that you're, you know, unwilling to bend. And I don't mean bend in so far as like you should betray your own sense of the story or the characters or anything, but, you know. If, if, you know, if, if five people read the script and five people say like, hey, I have this note, this character at this one, you know, listen to that. You know what I mean? If, if, if you're hearing it multiple times, uh, there could be something to it. But at the end of the day, if you don't believe it, then then uh, you'd be remiss in your duties as the, the keeper of the story. If you're a writer or a director to uh, to pander to uh, to the people who um, would want would would change your story against your will. You can't do that. Yeah. So. It's well, you know, I think it's speaking of cognitive distortions, right? We overpersonalize things. No question. Right? Yep. Anyway, note does a note on your script isn't a note on you as a writer, right? It's more of like yes. taking that with a grain of salt and sort of yeah. adding it to your process. Sure. It it certainly feels like that though. <laughs> it certainly sure. feels like a note, you know what I mean? How dare you? Like I I <laughs> cried when I wrote this scene. And now you you know what I mean? It's like, you know, yeah, yeah that stuff's gonna happen, you know. Of course, yeah. right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so sort of as we kind of enter this like light, you know, later portion of the interview. So I'm uh, sure. very curious um your approach to the horror of the film. Yeah. Um, and how you want to sort of achieve certain scares or have that atmosphere. What was kind of important to you in that process? Yeah. That's an interesting question. I'm glad to have the uh the opportunity to talk about it a little bit because I think maybe um the aesthetic approach that we took was hopefully a little bit dissimilar from the approach that a lot of other horror movies take. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember before the interview started, I remember we talked about me having to learn how to use Adobe InDesign <laughs> because <laughs> I made this, this lookbook, you know, this creative prospectus. And one of the things that I was very adamant about early on was that, um, you know, all of the typical sort of screen grammar that comes along with, um, contemporary horror uh, mm -hmm. on screen. I just really, I wanted to stray as far away from it um, as possible, you know, and, and and I'm certain, you know, there are so many um, contemporary horror films that I, that are super dear to me that I love wholeheartedly. So I'm in, in, in no way, shape or form am I like ripping any other filmmakers or any other films. But what I wanted to do with this was I, you know, I wanted to put character first. I wanted to put, you know, mm -hmm you know, world first. And I didn't want to do anything in terms of, you know, style that would be so overt or like, so like, you know, I'm, we need to scare somebody in this scene. Yeah. No, no, I, I, that wasn't my aim at any point. You know, I always wanted to say, I want to connect someone to these characters or this character at this point. And how do I do that? And I, this sounds, you know, people might, might get some eye rolls at this point. Part. but i'm being sincere i'm being sincere um you know i always say this is a horror movie we premiered at the brooklyn horror film festival but my goal with this movie was absolutely not to like scare the shit out of people it was you know to 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 hopefully to sort of unsettle people for sure yeah to to use 
uh, you know, genre to underline sort of the how terrible some of these mental health afflictions can be. And uh, just always prioritize character and never worry too much about how we were using technique or, or screen grammar to sort of, you know, I, I, I tried to outlaw jump scares. Yeah, which, which I call startles. I don't, you know, I'm always like, if this movie, if this made you jump out of your seat a bunch, of time, I don't think it was. It didn't scare you. It startled you. Startled. I think that's that's different. That's fair. Um, you know, it's not a it's not a haunted yes, house. It's a yes, movie. yes, and there's a very sort of uh, there's a very simple formula for doing that. I think now there's a lot of great films that can do both, and those are the good ones. They'll scare mm -hmm. you and startle you, which is great. But um. I think you have to yeah, earn I, the startles. No, um, no question. No question. You know what yes. I mean? Yes, like, yes. I will hands down say that you, the best startle, as you might say, you, I watch uh, Haunting of Hell House. Yeah, the car. You're talking the about car. You're That's talk the about best the one. I, can't, you know, I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. think anyone yeah. has. A, yeah. because, because, like you say, it's character first. That startle came at the height of character no question. tension. No question. He earned so that it. in that one. And it was because, you know, it's, it, you know, um, because it hadn't been overdone, because it was such a character-driven piece, that whole that whole uh, that whole series was fantastic. The, right, the characters right. were extraordinarily fleshed out and three-dimensional, and like it's like go for it, baby. Yeah, yeah. send her the, the out of the back. You know like, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah but I, th I think that you would you would shoot that here, right? In the sense, because like you certainly do have tense moments, and there are classic kind of horror moments in your film. But I think it's sure. sort of at the height of character moments, right? I, mean, I don't want to, it's definitely the midpoint scene. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, of course. Lead up. I'm not spoiling that. Of course. Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> but I think no. you do lead up to it in a, in a sort yeah. of character first way. You're absolutely right. And, and, you know, I, I and I, uh, I did, to be clear, I didn't mean that I was, you know, I, I, I paid no mind to the, to the sort of the, the potential for being frightening uh, right. or, or unsettling, but uh, it certainly wasn't the priority, but I think, you know, um, yeah, I think that I guess most of the times when we have sort of these scarier scenes, these sort of horror centric scenes, mm -hmm. they're coming at times when Ryan has just been through something that's probably triggered him. In it's a very 2023 word, but it's super apt. Yeah. Very, very, it, that, that's triggered some part of, you know, be it generalized anxiety or his panic or his depression or reminded him of his father or, or whatever else, you know, yeah. uh, and just like these nuances. And, you know, even like when, you know, he goes to deliver the pizza, um, you know, in the, in the back half of the second act and, you know, he sees these two young girls at this table that are about the same age and, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a small detail, but it's like, you know what I mean? What maybe that reminded him of, of, of him and Jason, you know, sitting at the yeah. kitchen table, you know, coloring when they were kids or whatever else. And, you know, um, it's, I tried to put, you know, maybe some stuff in there that wasn't necessarily like super explicit, but that if you watched it again, or if you, if you gave it some extra thought, maybe would, would stick out at you. Um, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Maybe, I, yeah. say, I love sort of how the sentimentology was sort of wrapped up in the escalation of the horror of it. Yeah, and yeah. it feels very tied in like the DNA of the film. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. No um, what are some of your kind of like coming away from the shade a little bit and what, what are your personal horror favorites, personal influences? What, what sort of gravitates you to the genre? In uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, know, I am a, I am a huge horror fan it's funny when you talk about influences um i think that it's i always tell people like i know i have my favorite filmmakers i have my favorite films mm -hmm. um they've probably influenced you know what i'm doing in ways that i'm not necessarily specifically you know thinking about and sometimes you can be surprised like you know i remember and this is going to shock no one i'm sure everyone watching this will have heard of uh the new york filmmaker named uh stanley kubrick but, um, yeah. you know, the, the shining is certainly one of, um, my favorite horror films of all time. And even in some of the, you know, uh, I, I kept preaching, you know, to, to my cinematographer, uh, Tom Fitzgerald, 
uh, at the beginning when we were prepping, I was like, I want to do something. I want to, I want to do something super boiled down. You know what I mean? I don't want to cover these scenes from like a hundred different angles. I want to be, I, 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 you know, I want to shoot with conviction. Like, let's pick the frame. Like, that's what we're going with for this. And I, yeah. when I watch some of, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, maybe some people, but when I, when I watch some of the therapist scenes, it reminds me of, you know, Jack Torrance's interview at the beginning mm -hmm. of The Shining with a very simple singles. You know what I mean? We're yeah. not, you know, we don't, we don't have a master over the shoulders, you know, uh, two mediums, two tights, like, Kubrick's like, look at these are the frames. This is how I'm shooting this. You know, um, pay attention to the performances. Pay attention to the story. Um, and that's sort of, I guess, my entire approach to you know, screen grammar is is keep it keep it simple. You know, yeah. don't 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 let overt stylization. Um, and I I'm not saying Kubrick wasn't an incredible stylist, but don't let overt stylization ever overtake what what's happening with the characters or, or within the story. And now that that like snotty answer is out of the way, um, <laughs> I can say I fucking love like new French extremity stuff. I remember when I was a kid um, and I had just gotten out of college and I was watching all these like incredible, you know, like brutal, like insane, like French horror movies. I remember Martyrs made like an incredible impression on me Ooh, um, yeah. inside. Like, it, you know, it's certainly not like, my brain doesn't work in such a way that I would be like writing and making stuff like that. But anytime I see something that I feel like is boundary pushing like that, or that it's like not only boundary pushing and brutal, but also like thought provoking, mm -hmm. um, it really sticks out to me. Um, I, I, yeah, I love those movies. You know, I always I tell say, people, we weren't going to really see much of that in America, but look at Terrifier too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely. The legs that had, right. So you never <laughs> yeah. know. No doubt. Yeah. And good for Terrifier too, right? I mean, that was like a, what, like a $250,000 movie that I think I made like 15 million bucks, like in the box office. Well, I mean, it was going to have like, a one night engagement. Terrifier too. I know. Yeah, right? I but, love um, it. you know, they mean, they know can you. happen here too, but, you know, there's an audience for it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, you know, I always tell people um, one of my favorite independent horror movies of the 21st century is Ty West's uh, House of the Devil. I absolutely, Ooh, yeah, absolutely love that movie, and I love the way it takes its time. It's super patient, um, and I always, I always use that word patient. And it's funny because Joseph Hernandez, um, one of the programmers, who's just the sweetest man in the world, um, used that word on stage at the Q and A. He said, "I feel, you know, it was a question for all the actors." And he said, you know, how did patience, this is a very patient, empathetic movie. And I was like, oh, I say patient all the time <laughs> about The House of the Devil, which is a very different film yeah. um, than The Shade. But yeah, I think Ty West is a genius. I've always loved um, all his stuff. I'm so happy, um, you know, that he's he's finally getting the recognition he's due with uh, with X and Pearl. I can't wait to see Maxine. I, they're like um, the Blu-rays are literally sitting right here. Yeah, yeah, X absolutely. People. I yeah, had it oh. digitally, but I was like, I'm I'm getting back into physical media, so like I'm like, let yes. me get some favorites. <laughs> I am a huge physical media person, a nerd. One might my girlfriend is, you know, much of my girlfriend's chagrin. She's like, Why are we getting like Blu-rays in the mail every day? I'm like, they're just coming. I, I can't even explain it to you. Somebody's <laughs> ordering them and having them sent here. And uh yeah, yeah. I used to be all I mean, like I I I don't know where they all are now, but all the VHS tapes that I used to have and sort of um, you know. <sighs> I kind of went into the digital era, but then, then you, and then I started to kind of like understand a little bit more of like the fact that you don't own the digital media. And that kind of yes. drove me a little crazy. Yes, right. Yes. Isn't that terrifying? Did you read yeah. that story about the guy who had, had spent like $40,000 on his iTunes library and then like Apple just like snatched it away from him. They were like, no, like, I don't know if he was like password sharing or what they got oh. mad at him. Well, I thought uh, I read but, an article about, like someone like I think honestly it might have been like Bruce Willis or someone. It's like someone who was like trying to put like when iTunes kind of first started putting out movies and stuff, mm -hmm. and um like someone's famous like him was buying up all this stuff and wanted yeah. to put it in his will that he would leave it to someone and he couldn't do it. Oh, real a digital library because you can't. Yeah, you can't yes. pass the rights of a digital library yes. over. Right? Because like you don't saying. actually own them. I think what the best way, and I'm I'm no lawyer, so no one quote me on this. But I think what you're doing is is you're licensing them in perpetuity until whoever's providing that 
either decides to stop providing it to you or they like go out of business. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like if you're buying movies on, you know, your Comcast account and then you move to Arizona and get whatever cable provider, whatever, you know, it's yeah. like they're, you, you don't have that. That's it. Uh, yeah. They're, they're semi -permanent gone. Permanent rental. You've lost them. That's correct. Yeah. Semi, semi permanent rental. That's yeah. really all it Brevity. Is. Brevity's not my thing. That's obviously a skill you have that I don't. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, but I so kind of last couple of questions, you know, I don't want to keep you too long. I really appreciate your time. Um but not. Uh, I know that there's there was it was you guys talked about a little bit in the QA and I and I sort of saw some comic books. There's apparently there's an expanded sort of aspect to the show. Yeah, absolutely. So what's that um, all about? So what we did so we we um Red King Publishing, which is a, which is an arm of, of Red King, Red King Cinema. Um, what we did was we went out and found a bunch of, of comic creators, graphic novel creators, writers and artists. And we wanted to do an anthology of short graphic novel stories that basically were shade adjacent, but mm. didn't have anything specifically to do with uh the content of the film so we okay. said like hey you know uh we have this this movie called the shade this idea and you know if if you know the center of our film revolves around you know this character or this sort of force that is emblematic of you know grief you know generational trauma mental illness whatever kind of word you want to use um we would like you to create sort of your spin on that on that idea. So we didn't want to box anyone in. So we said, just like, go for it. You know, um, we had a great, uh, creative director named Adam Miller, who's a, who's a terrific artist and, and, and did an, an alternate cover and a pinup for the book as well. But, you know, he wrangled up this absolutely stellar, uh, group of, of, of writers and, and illustrators. And we have six, uh, beautiful, um, sort of, heart-rending stories to steal a phrase from from michael boatman um that are that are sort of along the lines thematically of what we did in the film but are not specifically tied to the to the narrative of the film and, and we're, we're super excited about it we're super happy about it um we were at new york comic-con we had a booth there for all four days um we got to yeah it was it was fantastic it was a great experience and you know dave and i you know as much as we love um movies as much as we love cinema we we you know um we want to branch out and do different things and give other you know extraordinary uh independent artists uh, a way to to sort of you know flex their skills you know uh do some work uh, yeah so so that's so what how we're doing add the anthology to their collection is it for sale because clearly i don't know if you can tell i'm a bit of a comic fan myself i love it yes yes so, <laughs> so i want to put it on that yes. show so i will say right now um we have a digital version of the anthology available for purchase on our website, uh, redkingcinema.com. We also have a little bit of uh, physical stock left, which after we've inventoried, we'll be adding to, um, to the website for purchase. But I can tell you this, Steve, I will send you one, sir. You do not. Oh. You, you do not have to buy one. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you uh, having me on, and yeah, yeah. So you know, just uh, just shoot me uh, your mailing address, and I'll, I'll send one over. Oh, I really appreciate it. Thank oh, you no so problem. much. No problem. Um, so beyond that, what's sort of the future for the shade? Is is it sort of continuing the festival circuit? Will there be a home yeah. release, digital release? What's kind of the plan? I think all that stuff will happen. You know, obviously, one of the interesting parts of the process when you're making an independent movie is obviously, you know, um, selling the movie, you know, uh, distributing the movie. Um, we've been lucky enough to, you know, to, to have premiered at an incredible festival that, that, that hopefully opens some doors, uh, that we're excited about, you know, um, we are at Orlando film festival, uh, in just a couple of days. And then again, on Halloween, we're playing in Orlando, I will personally be traveling to St. Louis for the St. Louis International Film Festival and then heading right over to St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada for the Fog Fest Festival where the shade is the closing night movie. Um, we're at Days of the Dead uh, Festival in Chicago and Atlanta screening. Um, we have a lot of very exciting things happening. Um, yeah. that all, very, all that information that very is thankful for. in the description below yeah, yeah. So anyone watching can kind of follow yeah. along. I said it very quickly. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and you know, I'm... Um, 
the goal really is, you know, once once this thing's out in the world, I mean, Dave and I uh, last summer, not even summer uh, 2022, but summer 2021, we outlined uh, an entire follow up film called The Seventh Gulch that I'm super, super excited about. And I, you know, I've been trying to stop thinking about momentarily while all the shade stuff is going on. But uh, yeah, so hopefully, you know, before next year uh, is over, we're we're in prep on our our second feature film. So that's you know, awesome. Keep your fingers crossed for me. Fingers if crossed. You, yes, that's sure. right. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for joining me. And I'm so excited to see like what the future is for the shade, for you, for Red King. Um, where can people find you to follow along on what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you go to redkingcinema.com, we have all our social media stuff on there. I myself am only familiar with Instagram. I know that's sort of shameful in today's <laughs> social media uh, involved worlds, but, uh, red Kings at red King cinema is our, is our, uh, Instagram handle. Um, you know, all the updates, anything you want to know. And I hope you do want to know, uh, you can find there. So, uh, yeah, follow along. We're very excited, uh, to get this thing out there and, and, and have people, yeah, hopefully, uh, connect with it like you did, Steve. I can't thank you enough for, uh, for, uh, yeah, introducing yourself after the screening and for having me on. I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for everyone watching Voices from the Mausoleum. We will catch you next time. Awesome. Thank you.